We are excited that you all are here for our session today. This is session 201, discussion about thyroid nodules and pathological diagnosis and types of thyroid tumors and pathological features. Uh, my name is Brittany McKelvey and I will be the moderator today. I am a papillary thyroid cancer survivor, originally diagnosed at 13 and happy to be with you all today. I also have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, uh, Dr. Zubair Balash. Uh, he is the professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He earned his medical degree from Liaquit Medical College in Pakistan and his PhD from Hahnemann University in Philadelphia. Uh, Dr. Belush's research expertise is in molecular and amino pathology of thyroid neoplasia, and his clinical expertise is in endocrine pathology, including cytology and histopathology. So we're really excited to hear his talk today. So thank you so much for taking the time this morning, doctor, and we look forward to your talk. Uh, thank you, Brittany, and thank you to Gary and the organizers for um, for the session to really invite me to give this talk. Uh, thyroid disease is close to my heart and close to my home also because I have few friends who have um, undergone uh, thyroidectomies for thyroid cancer and they are survivors and they are really li living very happy lives. Um, so, and my interest in endocrine pathology kind of really, so it kind of helped me not just my patients but actually my family also. So I feel this to be very close to my heart. And again, I think this is an honor to be talking to you from a pathology point of view about thyroid nodules. So I think uh, we're going to take a shot. So this is actually, I'm going to go back to the slide just to show you four of the best spots in Philadelphia that I find sometimes peace with. Because as you know, for a couple last couple of years, we have gone through pandemic and slowly it's kind of dissipating, thank God. Um, because of vaccinations and the stuff. And, you know, so these are the spots where I really find walking and just sitting down and kind of meditating and thinking about life in general. So, so if you are in Philadelphia or if you are from Philadelphia or happen to be in Philadelphia, please visit these spots. It's uh, Philadelphia is a very walkable city. So I think um, I'm going to start from this point of view and what, it, what is like well, how the patient sees the what a pathologist is. So pathology term comes from pathos, which is, um, you know, disease, um, which is a Greek word. So it's actually vaguely defines as the study of disease. And, but I think the pathologist is what is always known. And that's what I got interested in pathology as the pathologist is the doctor's doctor. We kind of work behind closed doors, but when we are a cytopathologist, we also biopsy thyroid nodules. And so we are like basically the face of pathology. And it is basis of all clinical medicine because it really digs into deeply why disease happens, uh, how they progress, and what are the features that define, that helps the clinicians to define the prognosis of thyroid cancer. So this is, I think that's why I really personally got in, interested into uh, thyroid uh, pathology because to me, this is a small organ, but when you really think about it, basically controls the entire body um, by, by thyroid hormone secretion and other hormones. So, so this is what I'm going to talk about. And I think that I personally think that I am a, not somebody who is a nerd who just sits in his office, closes the door, opens up a window and looks at the slides of thyroid uh, cells from either a thyroid nodule biopsy or thyroid resection of specimens, surgical specimens. But I think I'm an integral part of the thi uh, thyroid cancer management team and also thyroid nodules. So what I'm gonna talk about is thyroid nodules and where does the pathologist comes in in diagnosing so how they can manage thyroid nodules if it's benign left alone, and if it's uh, atypical or malignant, then it goes for surgery. And we are also going to touch about the molecular markers or genetic makeup of thyroid nodules that also is becoming a big deal now. It helps us in diagnosis and management of this disease. And we're going to talk about thyroid resection or surgical pathology specimens. That means the specimens that a pathologist gets after surgery. And I think it's, I'm going to show you some photos, which is may, if you are, um, 
uh, week, um, you know, uh, and looking at it because it's it's kind of a it may be gross to some of you, but that is my bread and butter of living. So I'm going to really talk about what how it happens behind closed doors and how do you get a diagnosis of cancer or non-cancer. So let's start with basics, and I think this is for me even to this day. Sometimes I go back to this and try, kind of put this together because the basics of thyroid glands are very important to understand. So when, if we look at this, um, we are thinking about how a thyroid gland looks like. So I think if you look at this, the thyroid gland is formed of these structures which are called follicles, which are lined by cells which are called thyroid follicular cells. And those thyroid, this is actually how the section looks like. And this is actually a cartoon. And this is actually the real uh, uh, thing. And you can see this is that pink material within the follicles is the colloid. And these are the cells which surround this follicle. So, and they are the ones which make thyroid hormone. And that is kind of stored in this colloid material, which is fills up the follicles. So this is the basic functioning unit of uh, thyroid. As we know, thyroid gland is, has two lobes, right and left lobe, and which are, do, uh, in the, which are joined by what is called a isthmus. So thyroid has three parts, two lobes joined by this middle portion, which is called the isthmus. And it sits actually basically in front of your trachea. And this is just a diagram to show how the thyroid hormone is formed. So this is actually the basic understanding of what thyroid gland is and how I see it on the slide under the microscope. Now, when we think about thyroid cells, there are two main types of thyroid cells. The most, which we are gonna talk about is the thyroid epithelial cells, which is the follicular cells from which most of the tumors come, common tumors in US. And then there's a C cell, which gives rise to different type of tumor that we'll talk about is called medullary or medullary carcinoma. When we think about tumors arising from follicular cells, there are two types of tumors. One is called benign, the other one is the malignant. And most of these malignant ones that you're going to have surgery for. And even in some benign ones, if they are too big to cause problems in um, swallowing or breathing. So when we think about the follicular cell, which is the most common um, tumor that you're going to have, there is the malignant tumors, the most common in US is papillary thyroid carcinoma. The least common is the follicular carcinoma. And then you have another group. So because if you think about papillary carcinoma, most of these tumors behave um, not so malignant. That means if a, that tumor is removed, the patient can live their normal life. But then there's a group of tumors which are called poorly differentiated or high-grade carcinomas and anaplastic carcinomas, which are more aggressive tumors. So this is how the general food groups on the basis of which we uh, classify thyroid tumors or distribute their diagnosis. Now, let's go to how a thyroid tumor will present or a, even a benign or malignant it will present in the form of a thyroid nodule. Now, when a clinician sees thyroid gland, you can have either multiple nodules or a solitary nodule, or there may be enlargement of both glands without nodules, and that is called diffuse enlargement. So we, my discussion is going to mainly focus on nodular enlargement of the thyroid glands, which can be multiple or solitary nodule. So this is how the clinician sees first and a thyroid nodule is diagnosed in a patient. So let's kind of a little bit go in deeper into diffuse versus nodular. Now, when there is diffuse enlargement of both glands, and this is actually a pathologic specimen. So there is the, you have two lobes here and they are joined by this isthmus in the middle. And as you can see here, this is again, another uh, just a, a diagram depiction and it sits in front of your trachea. And this is, you can see there's no nodules in this gland. Both lobes are enlarged. And the causes for this is, is usually happens the diffuse enlargements of the thyroid when there is functional abnormality. That means your thyroid hormone is low or high. One, when the thyroid hormone is very much then as high, then it is called diffuse toxic goiter or Graves' disease. 
when the thyroid hormone secretion is low or hypofunctioning gland, that means it's not making enough thyroid hormone, the other cause for diffuse enlargement of the thyroid is chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis or Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, rarely, very, very rarely, some tumors may cause enlargement of both lobes of the thyroid. That means they have spread out throughout the both lobes or they are arising as diffuse, causing diffuse enlargement. And this is very rarely seen in tumors. But when you have diffuse enlargement of the thyroid, most commonly they are benign. So that's diffuse. So now let's focus on the nodular enlargements of the thyroid. As I said, most tumors present a solitary nodule or as a dominant nodule. In the background, you may have smaller nodules, but the tumor will be the, will be the nodule that can be easily palpated or will be readily detectable on ultrasound. Multiple nodules in the thyroid usually are benign, but I put a question mark in there because up to 60% of the US population by ultrasound may have one or more thyroid nodules. So the, the, the bottom line is that the tumors may arise in the background of multiple nodules. Now, when you, this is actually a gross surgical pathology specimen, which is actually, I'm going to just go on this. And as you can see here, it has, this is enlarged. So this is right and low, left lobe of the thyroid. And there is these multiple, multiple nodules. And this is how the gland will look like. So this is the cartoon depiction. This is trachea here, and this is both lobes of the thyroid, which are joined by the isthmus. So this is the, how the multiple nodules will look like to us. So let's talk about now thyroid nodules. I'm a pathologist, I'm a nerd. So whenever I go out uh, traveling, I always go to the museums. And the first thing I always pick up upon is looking at uh, the, the old, um, photographs are the paintings which show thyroid nodules. And as you can see, this is actually a Caravaggio uh, type painting. And as you can see here, there is the goiter. So naturally, even in those days, since this, these are more of the Italian paintings, and you can see this is the high power here, which shows you actually the um, thyroid nodules, even in those models. So the goiter is, is very common, and the thyroid nodule has been actually been affecting mankind for a long period of time. Now, the good news is that the majority, up to 90% of thyroid nodules are either benign, non-neoplastic, that means they are not tumors, or they are benign tumors. Um, and they are more, these diseases, is, um, as we know, um, by epidemiology is more common in females. But as I was pointing out, up to 60% of US population has one or more thyroid nodules. Now, when we look at the malignant group, as I said, up to 90% of them are benign. But if we look at the malignant group, it actually forms up to 5 to 10% of th all thyroid nodules that we see. And as I said, papillary carcinoma is the most common that you're going to see in this group. So, but it does not just stop to adults. You can also see thyroid nodules and thyroid carcinomas in children and they may act a little bit more differently. And actually, this is another painting here. Um, you can see the hair, there's a, a, a child here, which is like an angel sitting here, but you can see here, there's a thyroid nodule in this also. So the, even the, the pediatric age group having thyroid nodules has been going on for long periods of time. So now when you have thyroid nodule, the clinician decides this is a thyroid nodule. And now I'm going to look at it and see if you have multiple thyroid nodules, which nodule I'm going to submit for biopsy, which is also called as fine needle aspiration. And since this is the patient group, and as you know, some of you may have gone or your relatives may have gone through this biopsy procedure. So before this, what really kind of makes the clinician or even a pathologist think what will be in the history that will be very important for towards or point out towards having thyroid cancer? History of NAC irradiation. Um, you know, uh, if you go outside the US, Chernobyl is the biggest example where there was a fallout of the nuclear power plant and the uh, children got really heavily dosed with had a neck radiation. Also because of some kind of tumors in the childhood, the had a neck region is irradiated. 
Now, what we are realizing also for even papillary thyroid carcinomas and other carcinomas, family history of thyroid cancer is very important. So thyroid cancer can kind of concentrate in the families. And then naturally the physical exam and lab. So the nodule that is going to be biopsied or the nodule risk assessment, that means they look at multiple nodules on the ultrasound and they say, this is the nodule that is a little suspicious. We want a biopsy to make sure this is not cancer. It is really done by ultrasound. And based upon these ultrasound features, and this is actually, I'm listing multiple um, uh, systems that are available to assess those thyroid nodules from different countries and even US, which is the American Thyroid Association or American Association for Clinical Endocrinologists. The thyroid nodules are looked under ultrasound and then it's decided which nodule will be selected to be biopsied. So this is comes before the pathology. And then the nodule is biopsied under ultrasound guidance. So this is actually an example of a benign thyroid nodules which will be the more common. And this is the cells that are taken from these. Based upon these cells, the pathologist will decide that these look benign. And this clinical picture or pathologic features that we are looking at, by looking at these cells, we will decide that this is actually a benign nodule. And if it's resected, Let's say it's resected, it's a benign, but it's resected because it's big and causing compressive symptoms. And this is how, again, those large follicles that we talked about filled with colloid, and this is how a benign nodule will look like under the microscope. Now, how do we report thyroid cytology specimens or fine needle aspiration specimens? So the diagnosis actually is, the first diagnosis, which is very important, these are categories or diagnostic categories. If we do not have enough cells, we call it non-diagnostic. And so you can see this is all is on a spectrum. The diagnosis starts from the benign and then it goes down to the malignant. And each diagnosis has associated with a risk of malignancy. That means chances of cancer based upon this diagnosis. And these diagnoses, again, based upon what we see on pathology, we can decide whether this is benign or this is malignant. Now, when we think about this diagnosis, and this is how the clinicians will um, kind of tell the patient. So naturally you have benign diagnosis. That means we just have to follow up if you need to have surgery in most cases, no. And then there is the malignant diagnosis, which is definitely you have a malignancy and that needs to be taken care of by surgery. But when you look in the middle, remember we are looking at only few cells. There is what is called the gray zone diagnosis in which the pathologist cannot call it outright benign or cannot call it outright malignant. But in the middle, they will say, based upon this, looking at the cells, I'm worried about it. Now, I'm how much I'm worried about it will be based upon categories. When you're calling it just atypical cells, or you're calling it neoplasm, that this looks like a neoplasm, but I cannot say this is benign versus malignant, or I'm suspecting malignancy, but I cannot outright call it malignant. So this is not because the pathologist is cannot make a diagnosis because they are not good enough. It's because the pathologist is only faced with few cells from that large nodule on the slide and looking at those few cells, by looking at some features, we can definitely say benign or malignant, but then there is a big uh, portion of these uh, nodules, which I call it gray zone diagnosis, in which there is, now this is where the pathologist needs help and this is where the molecular test comes in to look at the genetic makeup of these cells and decide what is should be taken out or what should be left behind if it's benign. And you know, the most thyroid nodules do not cause symptoms when they are benign. So as I said, when we're looking at cytology or looking at that small biopsy specimen or fine needle aspiration specimens, up to 50% of these benign thyroid nodules can be diagnosed by looking at those few cells. I just want to give you a little fact. Before World War II, when there was no cytology of looking at those fine needle aspiration specimens or thyroid ultrasound, if there was a thyroid nodule, the thyroid had to be resected or surgerized to make 
decide whether this is benign or malignant. So you can imagine how much um, this final aspiration has caused less amount of surgeries because we're picking up more thyroid benign nodules by that. So the patient, not every patient needs to have surgery. And greater than 50% of cases, most of the common thyroid cancer is papillary thyroid carcinoma. Now, why cytology can diagnose papillary thyroid carcinoma by just looking at few cells? Because the nucleus, so if you look at the cell, there is the cell. So you have a nucleus and then you have a cytoplasm. So looking at that nucleus features of some of these, we can diagnose papillary thyroid carcinoma. So that's where you can see by just looking at those few cells, the pathologist can say it is suspicious for carcinoma or it is carcinoma. And that's, we talked about what cytology cannot do. So this is where the molecular testing has become more important. It is it's still an expensive test, which is, a, which is um, insurance pays in most cases, but it is it's still a very expensive test. So by selecting those cases, where cytology cannot be definite, molecular testing really helps. So I can see if you put it all together, you, the clinical presentation is very important. You know, multiple nodules, single nodules, causing symptoms, family history of thyroid cancer. Plus you bring in ultrasound and that ultrasound features decide what are the risk of malignancy. Then you kind of add in the cytology and then the molecular test, which will help to decide whether this is a benign neoplasm, that means it's adenoma, can be left behind in most cases, or what type of malignancy it is, by looking at these specific markers in thyroid nodule. So it is kind of complicated, but if you kind of think about, I always kind of teach my um, residents and students that it is like a lasagna model. So, you know, you have different layers and then you have the finished product. So the clinical presentation, ultrasound, cytology, molecular test in some cases, and then you have, you know, then you can make up a picture, the complete picture, which will help the surgeons or clinician to decide what to do. Now, what type of surgeries I see also as a pathologist. So as you know, there are multiple types of thyroid surgeries, which is like the total thyroidectomy when the entire gland is removed, subtotal thyroidectomy in which part of the gland is left behind, or you have thyroid lobectomy where one lobe and or a portion of isthmus, that adjoining portion here is removed along. So these are the three main type of thyroid surgeries a pathologist sees. Now, how do they look like? So I, I'm warning you, this is the time that I'm gonna show you real thyroid resection specimens, but remember I'm a pathologist, so this is very important to me. So this is a total thyroidectomy specimen in which the thyroid were removed. So now you can see the, this thyroid lobe which is the left lobe was in totally occupied by this large thyroid nodule. By just looking at it, and I'm not making you a pathologist, for me, when I look at this, this is a very large nodule, expensile, which has taken up the whole lobe. Actually, this was the benign nodule, but in the right lobe is this area. And to me, by looking at it grossly, I can say by looking at the gross examination and palpation, that this is the thyroid cancer. And this will be the nodule. So the biopsy was done on both nodules and the biopsy called the left lobe as benign and the right lobe as cancer. So to me, I can match it by what was called an ultrasound and cytology and look at it and say, this is cancer. So now this is again, so this is how it looked grossly. And this is actually a whole mark. That means I have taken a section of the entire lobe and you can see here it, it matches. And this is under the microscope. And to me, this is all benign thyroid. And to me, this, this is here where the cancer is. And as you can see, this is benign thyroid here. So this is all benign and this is cancer. And you can see how this tongues of cancer here, it kind of infiltrates. So it kind of is distributing throughout. So this is the cancer. So I'm taking, I have taken you from cytology then I have taken you to the gross examination and how this looks under the microscope. And based upon these features, and I can decide which type of thyroid tumor it is. So now I have thyroid tumor, now I have to classify it. And it is not that simple because if you put in the pathology and how these tumors behave. So again, two main groups, 
So if this is all a spectrum, so you have benign tumors naturally, which is going to be benign neoplasms and most common one is called adenoma. And then you have malignant neoplasms and most common will be carcinoma. But then you have a whole group of tumors in the middle, like what we talked about cytology, which is called the low-risk neoplasms. Now, what does it mean by low-risk neoplasms? The low-risk neoplasm means that if you have done a lobectomy, the thyroid tumor is removed, and the pathologist makes a diagnosis which clinically fits as clinically low-risk, the patient does not need to have total thyroidectomy or even radioactive iodine and other stuff. So they are done. So this is, this is something very important concept to really for, kind of understand even from a pathologist's point of view. And even in this malignant category, by looking at the patholo pathologic features, we can decide what tumors are going to be non-aggressive and which tumors are going to be aggressive. So this is a benign neoplasm, which we, I talked to you about and showed you. So this is a large nodule. This is an adenoma. This is a low-risk neoplasm, which is a tad higher on the malignant features, but it's still low-risk. And what I wanted to show to you that this tumor let me see if I can pull it up. Uh, just bear with me. No, I cannot. So when you when you see it here, this this tumor has actually, if you look at it, this like really white area which circles it. So that's a capsule. So it's an encapsulated tumor. Whatever is happening is happening in that capsule. So that's where the tumor is, and it's kind of separated outside from the surrounding thyroid by a capsule. So this is an encapsulated tumor, or this tumor has full capsule, which is not being invaded. So this is a low-risk neoplasm. And now when you still think about the malignant neoplasm, we have low-risk malignant neoplasms, which are encapsulated again. Then you can see this white area is the capsule. We have neoplasms which are intermediate risk, and then we have high risk. So this really is stratifying or separating them into these different food groups on how these are going to clinically behave is very important. And the pathologist is kind of on the center of it to really decide this. Now, as I talked about, we classify thyroid tumors as low-risk neoplasm and the malignant neoplasms are, which is the well-differentiated means. And if you think about it, they are still making thyroid hormone. They are still functioning and acting like the follicular cells that they have come from, and then we have poorly differentiated and anaplastic. And thank to God, the most common ones are well-differentiated carcinomas. And we talked about, they call well-differentiated because they are making thyroid hormones or secretions, which the other normal cells also do. And we really don't need to go into details. Papillary thyroid carcinoma is the most common one especially in areas of the world where there is enough iodine in the food. It's more common in genetic females. These tumors can also be small size. That means they can measure one centimeter or less. And we call them incidental tumors. Why we call them incidental tumors? Because up to 30% of US population has one of these tiny tumors in their neck. Nothing will happen to the patient. They will live their normal age uh, we know with that, and these will not even metastasize. So that's why we call them incidental tumors. They are slow growing. Most thyroid cancers, which are well differentiated, are slow growing, and papillary thyroid carcinoma goes to lymph nodes. That's why on an ultrasound, they will look at the thyroid tumor, and they will also look at the um, lymph nodes. Now, remember I said cytology, or by just looking at those few cells, Taking from the nodule, you can make a diagnosis of thyroid carcinoma, which is papillary carcinoma, because we have these nuclei and looking at these nuclei and looking at some of the features. So if you have just nuclei, you look at those features and you say, this is papillary thyroid carcinoma or suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma because we're looking at those nuclei. So that's why on fine needle aspiration biopsy or and on the ultrasound guided biopsy, we can see these nuclei and make the diagnosis. So let's talk about, again, when we get a gross specimen, and this is a specimen that I gross myself, what is suspicious? Is this large nodule is suspicious or this small one is suspicious? And by taking the sections, we can really figure out what is going on. So this actually, this small nodule was suspicious. And this is again, the cancer, which is 
kind of infiltrating, and this was a papillary thyroid carcinoma. This is actually a lymph node, and this is a small metastatic deposit, which is in the lymph node. Now, I do want to point out, if up to five lymph nodes, which have metastasis, which is less than 0.2 centimeters, that kind of cancer is still considered low risk if the tumor is confined or is within the thyroid and has not infiltrated out. So even based upon those pathologic features, having some of the lymph nodes positive with few tumor cells in it does not make it high risk. So the way we're looking at thyroid cancer has is changing dramatically. Follicular carcinoma is less common um, in US and it is more common in countries where there is iodine deficient diet. And the follicular carcinoma, we cannot make a diagnosis by looking at the nuclei. We have to see how this tumor is. So this is actually a follicular carcinoma, which has this capsule. This is the tumor, but as you can see how this tumor is infiltrating into its capsule. So when it invades, that's when we can really look at that invasion, <clears throat> excuse me, and say that this is follicular carcinoma. So the concept is making the diagnosis of cancer on nuclei, looking at the nuclei or looking at whether it invades. So this is how the pathologic. The other less common tumor is medullary thyroid carcinoma, which has a much more familial presence. It comes from C cells of the thyroid and it's made calcitonin. So this is another tumor which is less common. So when we put everything together, I think this is where the pathologist is really, really important. And I, I want you to love your pathologist because even we sometimes share bad news. We also decide what type of surgery should be done and how this tumor is going to behave. So this we talked about. So I'm gonna, in that layer of that lasagna model, I'm gonna add another layer of the surgical pathology that, so we are there when the biopsy happens all the way to the resection specimens and make these decisions on how these tumors are going to behave. And this is where all the molecular tests, the ultrasound features, your clinical exam, clinical diagnosis, everything comes together to make a final decision. And I think that is very important. So, you know, with the new CLEAR Act um, that has been instituted, the patient sees their pathology report even before the clinician sees. And sometimes it does create problem because there are words that you cannot understand. But our doors are always open as pathologists. So you have to know that the pathologist is an integral part of your clinical team. And you can call your pathologist because in the end, the knowledge is power and it has to be correct knowledge. You know, you have to understand what it all means in the grand scheme of things that is relates to you. Um, so I think, and I'm glad that you're part of this association and you are also attending these meetings because the information that is coming to you is the correct and right information. Because you know, in the era of the information overload, there may be some information outside available that may not be correct or may not pertain to you. Um, so I think you can call your pathologist and get the knowledge or get the point of view from a pathologist, what they mean by that. And I do talk to the patients, uh, my patients sometimes when they call me, but you know, the pathologist also goes so far because we have not that relationship, what you have with your amazing clinician, endocrinologist or surgeon, and they can give you more information on your clinical. I can talk to you about how I have made this diagnosis or why I have made this gray zone diagnosis on your cytology and not benign and malignant. And as I explained to you, it's not always black and white. Everything happens on a spectrum and which, which the patient has to understand. So knowledge is power and the correct and appropriate knowledge is much more powerful. So I'm, this is the um, uh, end of my slide. And I am going to now go into um, the, the chat function to see um, or um, Brittany can help me um, to. Sure. We, so we have a lot of great questions coming in. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just gonna start at the top here. A question from Stephanie, uh, recognizing that thyroid nodules are more common in women. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you had thoughts on why that may be, but also what specific type of malignant nodules is the most common in women? 
Okay, so um, so you know, um, the the jury is still out. Um, there are a lot of factors that um, we believe which may cause, and one of them is hormonal factors, because we think that some of these thyroid tumors, um, the way they occur or their way they're driven by is is has a hormonal basis for that. And that's why they are common in women. Um, and, you know, there has been uh, work done on estrogen. There has been work done on some of the reproductive hormones. So, but really we still, I, we don't know why that really happens. And the most common uh, cancer will be still be papillary thyroid carcinoma, which is the most common that we see in kids, um, in the females and even in, in, in the males. Uh, especially in U.S. Um, and even in outside countries, papillary carcinoma is still the most common uh, common tumor. Great, and then we have a question from Hugo uh, looking at the meaning of diffuse and sclerosing and the diffuse sclerosing variant of PTC. And then does this variant also still have nodules? Yeah, so, um, so diffuse disclosing variant is more common in kids um, in the younger age group. Um, you can also see it in the young adults, um, and rarely you can see them actually in the um, in older individuals. Now, diffuse sclerosis variant, as the word diffuse is, um, it basically infiltrates one or both lobes diffusely, but it still will have a central nodule, which is the cancer, and then it infiltrates. It has a lot of those calcifications or somoma bodies. It metastasizes to the lymph nodes. But when you look in the younger age group, it kind of behaves very differently than in the adult. One of the interesting things about diffuse sclerosis variant is that in the Chernobyl group, when we looked at those tumors, which were exposed to radiation because of the nuclear fallout, diffuse sclerosis uh, sclerosing variant of pa uh, papillary carcinoma was actually one of the main tumors. And molecular way, if you think about it more deeply from my end of the view, the molecularly, it's very different than the other uh, carcinomas of the thyroid. So it has its own molecular signature. Most likely it will cause enlargement and that's why it is sometimes mistaken for a chronic lymphocytic or Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And some patients may be diagnosed a little bit later in life because somebody said it looks like thyroiditis. But, so it can be diffused, but it usually has some nodularity to it, as I see on pathology. And, and I'm gonna skip down here to keep on the variant uh, theme as well. We had a question from Debbie specifically about um, BRAF and tall cell variants. Uh, I know you went into that a little bit uh, about explain kind of what those variants are and how that may impact Kind of treatment and prognosis when looking specifically at the BRAF and tall cell. Okay, so um, so if you look at the papillary carcinoma as the major food group, um, papillary thyroid carcinoma has different what we call as subtypes or we call variants. Um, so those subtypes are divided also further divided into the most common or low risk, which is the classic or conventional papillary thyroid carcinoma. And then there are these aggressive subtypes, which why by looking at the cell, we can decide which subtype it is. So tall cell variant is like the third or fourth most common subtype of papillary thyroid carcinoma. It usually presents as larger tumor. It presents in an older age group, and most of them have BRAF mutations. Now the mutations in the tumor itself not in the whole body. So there's no like a familial tumor going, stuff is going on. The thing with uh, tall cell variant is that it's more commonly associated with lymph node. And some of these tumors can transform into anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. One of the difficulties in some cases of tall cell variant is because they have aggressive pathologic features. They go, they extend outside the thyroid more commonly, they also can invade lymphatics or blood vessels, because if it invades lymph nodes uh, and lymphatics, it goes to lymph, uh, lymphatics. But if it also has blood vessel invasion, it can go and metastasize to other parts of the body. Rarely, some of these tumors may not respond to conventional radioactive iodine. And the BRAF has been shown that the BRAF positive tumors can have in some cases, not all, can be aggressive. So this is how the makeup of tall cell variant. So 
when we making a diagnosis of tall cell subtype, I'm just gonna add on something which you guys don't have to remember that if 30% or more of a papillary carcinoma cells show tall cell features, we call them tall cell subtype. And we make this diagnosis. And even if we have few cells that look like tall cell, we will call it, it has tall cell features because that, that component is the one which will go to metastasize to the lymph node. So, so we really watch for it because it does can follow an aggressive clinical course. But I also wanna point out that it's not applies to all these tumors because small tall cells will still act like small papillary thyroid carcinoma. Thank you. I think that's really helpful, all the kind of minute details with, with all the variants. And I wanted to follow up with another question we had from an attendee, because you just made the distinction of kind of the lymphatic system versus going the blood vessels. And there was a question about confusion about how metastasis to lymph nodes can still be considered low risk. And for a little bit more explanation on, on kind of where that lymphatic system uh, plays into it. So in the staging of thyroid tumors, the, the lymph nodes have become very important. Before it was, you know, like 10 or 20 years ago, we always thought lymph node mats mean bad. And now I will tell you, there are some patients which have one lymph node that has a very tiny focus of papillary thyroid carcinoma. But if this lymph node is in a very odd spot, that just can be washed because it will stay in the lymph node and it will not go out. So by looking at a whole bolt load of patients and how they behave, the, the clinical societies came up with this paradigm, which I think is amazing, that if a small metastatic deposit to a lymph node, which is, stays inside the lymph node, it's less than 0.2 centimeters, that means two millimeters, and it's actually not invading outside the lymph node, that can be still considered as low risk tumors. If the main tumor mass is encapsulated, it just shows some lymphatic invasion, it has not infiltrated throughout the lobe, based upon combining that and how the tumor is acting within the lymph node, it still still be considered as low risk. That means if a patholo on the basis of pathologic features, if we decide that and give that diagnosis, the patient may not need to lose their entire thyroid. Because remember, even in an experienced surgeon's hand, up to 6% of the patients will develop hypoparathyroidism. That means their parathyroids are removed during surgery, not fault to the physician, but because the way they sit so close. So there are thyroid cancer surgery risks. So if you, the patient does not need to go have total thyroidectomy, be on Synthroid forever because that has its own things, you know, so that, I think that is fantastic that we can even decide what type of surgery a patient needs based on pathologic features. And we can say, okay, your thyroid tumor was removed, small lymph node deposits, you don't really, we can give you a choice to keep the rest of your thyroid. So I think that that's where it all comes from and the follow-up studies. I know we only have about one more minute. Uh, there's a few more questions in the chat and we will be saving those questions uh, and sending those to Saika for the ones that we didn't get, but wanted to give you the opportunity. Thank you for so such an informative presentation. Any kind of last words to all of our attendees when thinking about pathology and thyroid cancer? So, you know, thyroid pathology is, is my passion, but I will not be an, I, I don't call myself an expert because I think there's always something to learn. I think um, it's you as patients which really empower us. Don't consider a pathologist who just sits in, in the office, really looks at, to me, you guys are, are at the end of each slide. As a patient, as a re rel re relative to the patient or somebody who's interested or doing these type of meetings. So I'm so much thankful and that to that what um, I am part of the clinical team and I really feel for you so much for the patients who are going through this. Um, but this is, there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is so much that is being done in thyroid cancer and we are understanding it every day and learning about it and how these tumors are going to behave. So thank you so much for giving me time. Thank you. I, I know I speak on behalf of all patients and survivors. We really appreciate you taking the time this morning and thank you all for attending. The session will be recorded um, and again, shared as well. So thank you all. Thank you.